Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Chapel. As part of the series in the five emotions of Inside Out, today Mr. Lee is going to be looking at the emotion of sadness. I wonder, is there something that makes you sad? Today, we're going to be walking through the school and asking people what makes them sad. Come along with us and see what they have to say. Uh, the Notebook uh, makes me really upset when I watch that movie. Um, it is a good movie, however. But yeah, there's just some aspects of that that uh, bring a tear to my eye. Uh, the song called How to Save a Life makes me sad. It's a really emotional song. So something that makes me sad is when I see other people who are sad and going through a tough time. So what makes me sad? Definitely uh, getting subbed off and having to sit the whole game on the bench. And that happens a lot to me. Um, what makes me sad are sad movies and the inefficiency of public transport. Something that makes me a little sad is seeing the little notification saying assessments due soon. Something that makes me sad is inequality that we see around the world, that some of us are so lucky um, and can't be generous with that. Uh, and also I have sadness in my family where I miss uh, my dad and I miss my sister's husband who died a long time ago. Something that makes me sad is when people are unnecessarily unkind to each other. Yeah, something that makes me really sad is watching the movie Pocahontas by Disney. You know, uh, she doesn't go with him in the end, and it's just a really sad story. He just like left, and he just left all alone. Yeah. Right. So what makes me sad? I think um, as a migrant, someone who who had to leave their home country, I think looking back and seeing the sort of challenges that South Africa is facing, and just how it's really struggling to lift itself out of those those problems, that makes me sad because that's my heritage. It's sad to look back um, and see that happening. What, what brings me sadness is seeing people that are all about themselves, um, selfishness really, the great sadness when you see that in people's lives and they can't see it themselves and trying to help them out of that is part of the challenge of, of what we do, isn't it, as Christian people. Something that makes me sad is just that there's so many people that don't know Jesus, our Saviour, who saved us from our sins so that we could be with God. It's just, yeah, everyone, everyone needs to know who he is. What makes me the most sad is movies and I love to cry my heart out when it comes to a good rom-com. What makes me sad? I think the things that make me the most sad are rudeness, uh, disrespect towards others and just a general lack of courtesy. It just makes me sad that people can't or won't see that we are all made in God's image. I mean, we don't all have to agree, right? with each other's ideas or opinions, beliefs, or even positions on various topics or issues. But surely, we can do unto others as we would have them do unto ourselves. What makes me sad? Uh, once again, many things come to mind. Uh, recently, an old teammate of mine who's uh, in his early 50s, I found out the other day that his wife passed away. She'd been unwell for many years. That made me really sad. Uh, another thing that makes me sad is uh, uh, when I see someone being treated unfairly, I always hate that. Um, but yeah, what, what makes me sad uh, recently is uh, the passing of one of my friends, his wife, very sad. Okay, what makes me sad? Uh, so on a not so serious note, I get really sad when I don't make my morning filter coffee properly. It's devastating. On a more serious note, I, I think I, I've been sad lately when I think about the loss of my nephew. He was born still, stillborn at birth. And uh, I, really, I really miss him, and I get sad when, when I think about the fact that my daughter won't grow up uh, al alongside him uh, in her life, so I get sad about that. When my daughter was born, uh, she was given this stripy monkey as a present. Uh, my daughter named him D, and the two became inseparable. It wasn't anything that she did or anywhere that she went without him. He was her best friend. Dee helped her learn how to fall asleep without the presence of mum or dad. Uh, he helped her be brave during her first trip to the cinema so that she could enjoy the movie rather than being afraid of the dark. And he got through her through some really hard times at the hospital, uh, of which there were many. Dee was as close to a family member as an inanimate object could get. 
And in my daughter's imagination, he was as alive and as sentient as the rest of us. Whatever she did, he did. Wherever she went, he went. A couple of weeks before her fourth birthday, uh, we went to the Gold Coast on a family holiday. We had a great time and even ran into the Christopolises at one point. But we overslept on the last day and we had to leave the hotel in a rush just to get to the airport on time. It wasn't until we were back home that my wife and I realised Dee wasn't in any of the bags. He was lost. And when my daughter realised this, she was inconsolable. At first she went deathly quiet and then her face broke open and she cried and cried and cried like she'd never cried before, her sadness filling the whole house. I phoned the hotel every single day for weeks. I emailed photos, I pleaded with strangers and prayed to God that somehow Dee would miraculously turn up. But each day the trail grew colder and eventually we all had to accept that he was gone. Now, I've made many mistakes in my life. I've said and done all sorts of things that I wish I could take back. But if you were to give me a time machine with just one trip on it, I'd go back to July 15, 2018, to our hotel room in the Mantra Towers, Surface Paradise, where I would check under the blankets in the main bedroom where my daughter slept that final night. And I would rescue Dee. And in doing so, I would wipe away all the tears, all the heartache, all the pain, grief and sadness that came with his loss. See, as we've reflected on previously, you and I live in a culture that is obsessed with happiness. A culture in which there's not only endless literature on how to find happiness, but an immense pressure to be happy and to be it all the time. You and I live in a culture where we literally tell our kids, don't be sad. Not because we don't care, but because most of the time we don't actually know what to do when someone gets upset. The beginning of Inside Out, which follows five emotions living inside the head of an 11-year-old girl named Riley, Joy doesn't know what to do with sadness. She doesn't get why sadness is there. She gets why the other emotions are there. For example, fear stops Riley from getting hurt, and disgust forms Riley's tastes in food and fashion. But sadness? Sadness doesn't seem to do anything other than make Riley cry. And most of the time she just lurks around headquarters being a major buzzkill. And this is why when Riley has her first day at a new school, Joy draws a circle around sadness and tells her not to step outside of it. She can't risk Riley getting sad. Naturally, things don't go according to plan. Uh, in a moment when everyone's distracted, sadness leaves the circle and makes Riley cry in front of her new classmates. And then when Joy tries to fix things, uh, both she and Sadness are accidentally ejected from headquarters and plunged headlong into the far depths of Riley's mind, a long way from the console. But here, Sadness begins to prove her usefulness. And without spoiling the film for those who haven't seen it, Sadness ends up being the hero of the film, ultimately saving Riley from an emotional death. And this is what makes Inside Out such a unique film. Here we have a film that, as one reviewer put it, stands in opposition to an entire culture that tells people that happiness is the highest, best, and sometimes only permissible emotion, that sadness is an obstacle to being happy, and that we should concentrate all of our emotional and cultural energy on trying to eradicate sadness so that everyone can be happy. Well, Inside Out isn't having any of that. In the end, the movie tells us that sadness is normal, that sadness is important, that sadness is not the opposite of joy, she's her partner. A Pete Doctor, the director of Inside Out, summed it up like this. He said, we all want happiness in our life, yet there's a real value to all the other emotions that is part of the richness of life. People don't want to experience sadness, and yet it's such a vital part of being human. Well, what is it about sadness that makes it so vital to our humanity? Today's reading provides us with some insight into this question because in it, we find the person who many consider to be the ultimate human being, overwhelmed with sadness to the point of shedding tears. John chapter 11, verse 35, is the shortest verse in English translations of the Bible. And it says this, 
Jesus wept. Now, I don't know what you think of when you picture Jesus, but I'm guessing it's probably not this. I mean, Jesus hanging on a cross with a crown of thorns around his head? Sure. Uh, Jesus smiling compassionately as he welcomes little children into his arms? Sure. But Jesus wailing loudly or shaking with silent tremors? Probably not. Yet that's exactly what the Bible says that he did. As we heard in our reading, when Jesus stood with Mary, the sister of his close friend Lazarus, the two of them staring at Lazarus' freshly filled grave, Jesus was overcome with sadness and he broke down in tears. Jesus wept. It's a strange picture. And it's even stranger when you consider that as God, Jesus was the ruler of the entire universe, which means he had the power to change anything he wanted at any time. In fact, a mere five minutes later, he would raise Lazarus from the dead. So if that was the case, why on earth would Jesus weep when he knew he was about to perform an amazing miracle and fix the very thing he and others were so sad about? Well, the answer is because he loves. Jesus cries at the death of his friend. Jesus is deeply moved by Mary's anguish because that's what love does when it's confronted by loss. See, the Bible claims that Jesus is the only perfect human being who has ever lived And that is why he doesn't refuse to share the pain of those he loves. Not even for five minutes. Not even when he knows that their tears of sadness are about to be transformed into tears of joy. I wonder, have you ever thought about sadness this way? Have you ever thought that the tears you shed might not be signs of weakness, but actually evidence of love? See, I reckon many of us are deeply uncomfortable with negative emotions, like sadness. So much so that whenever we feel down, we automatically assume that there's something wrong with us. We think, if only we were stronger, if only we had more perspective or more faith, well, then we wouldn't be feeling this way. The Bible takes a radically different view. See, unlike modern stereotypes of Christians as happy, clappy Pollyannas, The Bible is full of aching, grieving saints who tear their clothes and sit in the ashes when the world falls apart. The Bible says that if you care about others, if you care about this world and what God is doing in it, you will be and you should be full of sadness when either those you love or yourself experiences hurt, suffers loss or dies. As counterintuitive as it might seem, There are times when awful feelings like sadness and grief are exactly the right feelings to have, to the point where it would be wrong not to feel them. The English author and thinker C.S. Lewis once wrote that, to love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. If you don't want to feel sad, then don't love. Don't make yourself vulnerable like that. Close up your heart. But in doing so, you'll close yourself off to others and you'll be closing yourself off to life. By contrast, the Bible tells us that God so loved the world that he made himself vulnerable to it, giving his one and only son, sending him among us to take on our pain, shed our tears and ultimately shed his blood, dying the death we deserved so that we might know not only the depths of his great love for us, but the certainty of his promise that death is not the end and that one day he will wipe away every tear from our eyes and do away with all death, mourning, crying and pain once and for all. And because God has given us this certainty, this destiny, we too can dare to love. We too can dare to be vulnerable. We too can dare to cry. This July will mark three years since we lost Dee. 
Now that's three years my daughter's gone without him. Three years of going to bed each night without him. Three years of birthdays and Christmases and other special occasions without him. And Dee wasn't there when her little sister was born. Dee wasn't there when we moved house. Dee wasn't there when my daughter started school. And I can tell you this, if we didn't want to feel sadness, if we didn't want to feel pain, we wouldn't have talked about Dee once during those three years. But then we would have lost him a second time. So instead, we chose to make room for sadness. To help process the loss, my daughter and I made several collaborative paintings of Dee. Uh, this one currently resides in our lounge as a symbol of his permanent place in our family, uh, in our memories, in our hearts. Uh, my daughter's also made all sorts of pretend phones which she uses to call Dee, to give him updates, to find out how he's going, and to make sure he knows the way to our house. See, he's still very much alive in her imagination. And every now and then, she tells us how much she's looking forward to heaven because there she will see Dee again. She tells us that he'll be somewhere in a crowd and then he'll turn around and see her and she'll start running towards him and they'll have a big hug to make up for all the lost years and they'll finally be together again. You see, sometimes it's good to feel bad. And sometimes it's right to feel sad. So make room for sadness. For where there is sadness, there is also love.